Okay, we're going to get into analysis of financial statements, which is one of the critical components for finance. It's really how taking a look at how businesses operate. Um, so again, when we look at a business and they're publicly traded, and a lot of what we're going to focus on uh, in the course is either publicly traded businesses, larger corporations, or businesses that uh, have a full set of gap financial statements. And so that's kind of the premise. Private companies and even your house, um, all the same principles apply, but the availability of information is going to be, for comparative purposes, going to be a little bit more difficult. So most all publicly available or publicly traded companies have mandatory reporting requirements with the Securities and Exchange Commission, and they have to post uh, the information out on uh, a website called Edgar, and you're able to look up all this information. And so it starts with an annual report. And annual report, generally the chairman of the board will write a letter. Um, some of the most famous ones are Berkshire Hathaway's and the letters from Warren Buffett. Uh, and you can go out and take a look at those. There's actually books that have been compiled with all of Warren Buffett's letters and his observations around the market and such. Um, but there's a discussion of the operations in the annual report that generally cover what the business is doing and how it's doing. And then you've got your financial reports. And the financial reports uh, are required to have, at a minimum, these four items. The balance sheet, the income statement, statement of cash flows, and statement of retained earnings. And we're going to focus on how to analyze those in this chapter. So the balance sheet is a picture on a specific date. So normally the end of the fiscal year, December 31st, for instance, that shows what a firm's assets and liabilities are. So what the firm owns and how it paid for those things. And that's your assets and liability section of the balance sheet. If you need a refresher on balance sheet and some of the accounting uh, principles, take a look at uh, the mind tap section at the beginning and you'll see that there's some fundamental sections that you can look at with uh, financial statements or drop me a line. Um, but balance sheet is a snapshot in time of what the company owns and who it owes. It starts off, the balance sheet is organized from the most liquid to the least liquid asset. So liquid means you could turn it into cash easily. So cash is at the top. Um, and again, the, and then it kind of moves its way down through um, the asset list. Um, it starts with cash and cash equivalents. And in the U.S., all assets are stated in dollars. Um, and cash and cash equivalents are liquid, which means they're, they can be spent tomorrow. Um, then you've got to take a look at, when you're doing financial analysis, some of the assumptions or accounting methodologies that are used to value things like inventory. So you've got FIFO versus LIFO, first in, first out versus last in, first out. Um, how quickly the business is or is depreciating assets or amortizing intangibles. Um, so you've got accelerated depreciation versus straight line depreciation. All those elements you should cover in your accounting classes, but you'll also be applying here in, uh, in finance because they may impact the taxes. So the balance sheet, also, we're going to talk a, a lot in finance around the equity and debt pieces and how they're priced, um, which is the who you owe, whether you owe a, a lender or whether you owe the stockholders. And so it's a there's a breakdown generally on the equity side, which is going to be the right side of the balance sheet at the bottom. And again, just like on the asset side where you start with from most liquid, so closest to cash to least liquid, the hardest to turn into cash. On the right side of the balance sheet, on the who you owe, you start with the things that are owed most recently, so or most currently, so accounts payable and other payables that are due within the next 30 days, down to equity at the bottom, which is essentially the shareholders, so how much money they have um, retained in the business or invested in the business. And so you've got a breakdown of the common equity account. You've got the common stock at par plus additional paid in capital, a pick, and retained earnings, which are earnings that have been um, where the company has made money and instead of paying it out to dividends, has held it in the business and reinvested it in its operations. 
the book values on the financial statements don't generally equal market values, particularly as you get to the bottom part of the asset section or the bottom part of the liabilities or the, the liabilities and owner's equity section. So as you get to the bottom, as you move your way down in on the left side of the balance sheet, you start with cash and accounts receivable, and those are you know close to current market value. When you get down to things like fixed assets and land and, and other and other things that might be very difficult to turn into cash, they may also be um, worth a lot more than what you see on the balance sheet. So what you see on the balance sheet is called book value, and that's the value of the asset that, as the company's carrying it for generally accepted accounting principles. But, you know, for instance, if you bought a house and you paid $200,000 for the house 20 years ago, it would be on the balance sheet at $200,000 the cost. However, that house might now be worth $500,000. That's the market value. So the balance sheet reflects the cost minus depreciation, but market values are generally going to be different than that. Same thing on the equity side. So you're going to see, you know, common, common stock at par value plus additional paid in capital plus retained earnings. But the sum of that doesn't necessarily equal the stock price, the market value of the stock. So again, just remember, the book values are driven by generally accepted accounting principles and our accounting conventions when you're looking at a balance sheet. In finance, we're more focused on what's the real market value and what's the cash value. And so as a result, there's going to be some analysis that needs to be done to, to bring those market values and those book values into alignment and understand where there might be differences. And the other piece is the balance sheet is, you know, as it says here, there's a time dimension. The balance sheet is a snapshot of the firm at a specific date. So where the balance sheet is kind of at a specific date, when we talk about the income statement, that's measuring the changes in the balance sheet between two dates. And again, this goes back to those couple of accounting courses that are prerequisites, um, but I want to recover some of this to, to get the foundation in place. So let's take a look at a balance sheet. Um, you're going to see us uh, talk about Unilate Textiles throughout the course. Um, it's a, it's a made-up company um, that we can look at to do some of the analysis. It's going to appear again in your um, tests and quizzes. Um, so you can get yourself somewhat familiar with Unilate. Um, Unilate is, here's a December 31 balance sheet for Unilate for 2018 and 2017. And so you can see on the asset side, as we look at it, assets start with cash and cash equivalents. The most thing that's close to cash is cash. And then as it as you go down the, the balance sheet, it becomes less and less liquid. So it takes more and more effort to turn it into cash. And it also, as we just talked about a minute ago, doesn't necessarily equal the market value. So, well, 15 million of cash is 15 million of cash. 380 million of net plant and equipment may not be worth 380 million, maybe worth more, maybe worth less. Same thing when you look at the accounts payable and the liabilities and equity section. Accounts payable is $30 million. That's likely to have to be paid in the next 30 days or so, and you're likely to have to pay $30 million. As you get down here into retained earnings and common stock, this common stock may not be worth, you know, the excuse me, $130 million plus the $285 million of retained earnings. So it may not be worth the, the $415 million that you see here. It may be worth more. It may be worth less. And then generally what you're going to see in almost every presentation, particularly when we're looking at finance, is a comparative... Um, set of financials. So again, you're going to see 2017, where this was Unilate's um, financial position in 2017. And the other thing that we tend to use in finance to help us compare companies that might be of different sizes, and we're going to talk more about this as we get into ratio analysis, is what we call common sizing. So you're going to see percentages, so percentages of total assets that are cash, accounts receivable, etc. And you can see the prior year and sometimes that shows with a little bit more um, clarity how much of a change there has been between 
those assets over the course of a year, or as you're looking at two different companies, it might be much larger, much smaller than Unilate, um, how their balance sheets are comprised if you made them common size. So basically you kind of forced it to a percentage instead of with just raw dollars. So this is a typical, um, typical balance sheet. And again, as you kind of dig into um, the information, you've got some additional information which is going to be available to you. One is, is you start doing some of the calculations. So you go, okay, when you look back here, you can see that Unilate has 25 million shares outstanding, um, 25 million shares of common stock. So you say, okay, what do we have here for book value per share? Well, it's the amount of common equity. So common equity divided by the number of shares. So the book value in 2018 is $16.60 and the market value in 2017 was $15.60. However, as we talked about, market value per share and book value per share are gonna be different. And so the market value per share, the stock price in the market is $23 a share in 2018, 2017 was $25 a share. So as we start doing a little bit of financial analysis on Unilate, you're gonna see some of these things are gonna be indicators that maybe um, what you might think is going to be the answer might not be the answer and we're gonna explore why. So in this particular case, even though book value went up by a dollar per share, market price went down by $2 per share. So you should immediately be asking yourself as when you're looking at a stock, if it went from 2017 to 2018 and the book value went up, so the company made money, in theory, there's more value in the business, but the market value went down, what happened? What changed to make people feel like the future, and this is again, a, an important finance concept, the future value of that business has actually declined from 2017 to 2018. Networking capital, this is current assets minus current liabilities. So essentially those elements where you see current assets here, which is cash accounts receivable and inventory and current liability. So accounts payable, um, accruals and notes payable. So this is generally the amount, current assets are generally the amount that's going to be converted to cash within the next year. And then current liabilities is generally the amount that's going to be paid um, on the balance sheet in the next year. You can see that current assets minus current liabilities is networking capital. It's $335 million in 2018 versus $295 million in 2017. And all that is, is taking this number, total current assets minus total current liabilities. You can see those answers here. Net worth. So net worth is also known as stockholders equity. And it's the amount of total dollars that have been invested and retained in the business. And that's going to be your total assets minus total liabilities. So again, if we go back to the balance sheet, your total assets are $845 million. Your total liabilities are $430 million, which comprise $130 million of current liabilities, liabilities that will be paid within the next year, and then $300 million of long-term bonds. So when you take that $845 minus 430, you end up with 415 million, which is the sum of, and always will be the sum of the common or the equity, which is $130 million of invested plus the $285 million of retained earnings. So this was invested by the stockholders and this was retained by the business out of operations. And again, you can see that as we go from 2018 to 2017, book value went up, market price went down, net working capital went up, net worth went up. And then again, let's look at, oops, don't want my um, parentheses here, but you've got breakdown of plant equipment. So you had $680 million of gross plant equipment. So this is a total amount at cost that was actually spent by the company to buy the plant equipment and you had $600 million in 2017. So what this is gonna tell you is $80 million was spent in 20, in, from 2017 to 2018. So during 2018, $80 million was spent on new plant equipment. Then you have less accumulated depreciation. So every year that you buy 
or every every year you take a look at your equipment and it gets depreciated. And again, this is a an accounting concept. And there's multiple types of depreciation, and I'm not going to go into that uh, in any level of detail here. But essentially, as you depreciate the assets, it reduces the book value, book depreciation expense, which is a non-cash um, expense, and it's designed to spread the cost of that equipment over its useful life. And then um, you take a little bit of that every year. And so you had $50 million of depreciation taken. So you had accumulated depreciation of $250 million in 2017, $300 million in 2018, which means there should be $50 million of depreciation expense. So if you look at 2017, um, the, what's carried on the balance sheet is a net plant equipment of $350 million versus $380 million in 2018. And you can see that here, 380 and 350. And it breaks out this way. And this is all this information is going to be important as you start looking at the analysis of the financial statements. So the income statement is the next uh, major financial statement. It presents the results of business operations during a period of time. So from a date to a date. And it really measures, if you're an accounting, kind of accounting uh it measures the changes in the balance sheet from one date to another and explains why they changed. What was income, so revenues generated and expenses incurred during a particular period, whether that's a month, a quarter, or a year. Those are the typical periods in which income statements are prepared. So here's Unilates um, income statement for the years ending 2017 and 2018. So if you look at um, 2017, I'll walk you through these um, briefly. This is the common sizing that we were talking about on the balance sheet. So again, it kind of reduces everything to a percent of net sales. So if you look at 2018, we had net sales of um, $1.5 billion. And then we had variable operating costs of 82% of sales. So this is going to be the, op the cost of operations, 82, it stayed flat. So our gross profit is $270 million in 2018 versus $258.3 million in 2017. Then we had fixed operating costs, less depreciation. So this is going to be your fixed costs. Um, you had 85 million of fixed costs in 2017 versus $90 million of fixed costs in 2018, which gives us our earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization, EBITDA. And a lot of businesses are valued on EBITDA, which is really the cash flow uh, of, of the business, excluding those decisions that are driven by finance, which are, how did I finance my assets? So interest, the impact around tax and tax planning, Appreciation, which is the non-tax expense and amortization, which is, a, or excuse me, non-cash expense and amortization, which is a non-cash expense. So 180 million of EBITDA in 2018 versus 173 million, uh, 300 thousand dollars of EBITDA in 2017. Then we had depreciation of 50 million, and again, if you think back to the last um, last set of slides, we talked about depreciation being 50 million dollars in 2018. You had 40 million in 2017. So then you've got net operating income. So earnings before interest and taxes, EBIT, $130 million versus $133.3 million in 2017. So you can start now seeing why maybe that stock price has come down a little bit because earnings before interest and taxes is actually declining as both in both total numbers as well as a percentage of total sales. Then we had interest expense, and this is paid in cash. And so you have generally, so you had $40 million of interest expense in 2018 versus 35 million in 2017. So earnings before taxes, 90 million of earnings in 2018 versus 98.3 million in 2017. So even though sales went up, earnings have gone down from 2017 to 2018. Then you had taxes, and there's an imputed 40% tax rate. So you can see that they multiplied 90% by 0.4, came up with net income of $54 million. And again, same thing, 98.3 times 0.4, give you a total tax uh, amount due of $39.3 million, so net income of $59 million. So again, the, what you've got is a situation where you know, 
even though sales are going up, a couple other things have gone up too. Fixed operating costs have gone up, depreciation expenses gone up, interest expenses gone up faster than net sales went up. So as a result, net income has actually gone down. So earnings available to common stockholders, which is EAC, earnings available to common, was 54 million in 2018 versus 59 million in 2017. We paid out common dividends of $29 million in 2018. We paid out $27 million of common dividends in 2017. So the addition to retained earnings in 2017 was 32 million. The addition to retained earnings in 2018 was 25 million. And if we go back to the balance sheet, you can see first here's that 300, uh, $50,000 or $50 million of depreciation. You see 250 to 300. You can see that that's reflected here. And then when you look at retained earnings, it went from 260 to 285, which is $25 million. And you can see how we got to that number. So that's the basic walkthrough of the income statement. When we take a look at our per share data, which is how companies that are traded tend to be tend to be viewed, we had 25 million shares outstanding in both 2017 and 2018. So earnings per share is net income divided by shares. So $2.16 a share of earnings per share in 2018 versus $236 or $2.36 of net earnings per share in uh, 2017. So earnings per share went down. Dividends per share, which is the amount that we paid out in common dividends divided by shares, is $1.16 was paid in 2018 versus $1.08 was paid in 2017. And that's just this number divided by 25 million and this number divided by 25 million. The next and perhaps the most misunderstood and underanalyzed um, financial statement is the statement of cash flows. It's probably the most important statement if you're looking at it from a financial perspective and how a business um, survives. And it reflects the effect of the firm's operating activities in three categories, operating, investing, and financing activities. Over the same period, um, generally is the income statement, and it really records the changes in cash. So how much cash the company has in the bank. And cash is the most important element for finance. We're trying to measure cash flows generally. And it's also the lifeblood of a company. Without cash, you could be profitable. And we'll kind of show how you could be profitable, but actually make no cash. And if you don't have cash, you can't pay your bills. And if you can't pay your bills and you can't pay your employees, you're out of business, even if you're profitable, because you haven't been paid in cash by converting your inventory or house receivable to cash. And... The uses and sources of cash are, is another way to describe the statement cash flows. Now, again, not going to do a complete rehash of your accounting class, but statement of cash flows, here's your general rules. If a liability account goes up, that means that you've borrowed some money, so you've got some cash. If an equity account goes up, that means you've got someone's probably invested in the business, so you've got some cash. If an asset account goes down, that means you've converted an asset generally to cash, and so you've got some cash. Uses of cash, liability account goes down, you've generally paid off a bill, and so you've used cash to pay down a liability. The equity account goes down, you've generally paid a dividend out, and so that's, that uh, is a use of cash. Or if an asset account goes up, you've bought something of value, and so cash goes down, but the asset goes up. So now we're going to walk through the sources and uses of cash for Unilite. You can see that cash decreased by about $25 million, even though we made additional money this last year. So we want to understand, even though we made money, why cash went down. So that's best analyzed by looking at the sources and uses of cash here on the balance sheet. So Let's take a look at the balance sheet changes. We had accounts receivable go up by $20 million, which means that we made sales of $20 million, but didn't collect the cash. We collect, we got an IOU. And so that's essentially a use of cash. We, we let someone borrow money from us in the form of accounts receivable. We increased our inventory from 200 to $270 million. So we bought more inventory, stored it, 
haven't sold it. And so as a result, we invested $70 million in additional inventory. And then we had gross plant and equipment. So we started with 600 million. And as we just saw a couple minutes ago, we went to $680 million of gross plant and equipment. So we spent an additional $80 million on plant and equipment. So that's a, we spent $170 million um, on this additional, on this additional equipment. Now, how did we pay for, um, pay for that? So we said, okay, we borrowed, we have, we borrowed an additional $15 million of accounts payable. So we essentially have slowed paying down some people or we haven't paid some people yet. So we've issued, we've had people issue IOUs to us for 15 million here. We've had people say, okay, we've gotten accrual, which is a, which is an expense that hasn't been paid. Like a crude payroll has gone up by 5 million. We had notes payable. So this is a short term borrowing. And we borrowed an additional $5 million there. And then we issued another 45 million of bonds. So we essentially have said, okay, we've got an additional $45 million of long-term bonds out. So we borrowed an additional $70 million. So this nets to $100 million of net uses of cash. So let's kind of walk through how that looks in a statement of cash flows. We started with 54 million of net income off the balance sheet, or excuse me, off the income statement. And then that generates um, certain cash flows as well. So depreciation, you'll see that this is a standard gap um, statement of cash flows. Depreciation is a non-cash expense. So we get to add back $50 million of depreciation. You see the $15 million in increase in accounts payable, and you see the increase in accruals of $5 million. You also see here that we had the increase in accounts receivable of 20 million coming off the sources and uses here, right there. And then the increase in inventory of 70. So you sum all this together and you get to a net cash flow from operations of $34 million. Then you have the acquisition of fixed assets of $80 million, which again, if we come back, that was right here. And so then that becomes your cash flow from investing. Long-term investing is minus 80 million. And then you have financing activity. So formal borrowings and investments. So you said, okay, I had notes payable of five, an increase in bonds of 45. That's all reflected here. And then we paid out dividends. If you recall, going back to this page paid out dividends of 29. So that flows in here. So we had net cash flow from financing of, four, of 21 million. And so the net change in cash is minus 25. 34 million of net cash in from operations. $80 million went to investments. We got a net $21 million in from financing activities. So the net change in cash is minus 25. We started with 40, we end with 15. And again, this is a straightforward statement of cash flows. It's easy, easier to put together when you start taking a look at the balance sheet sources and uses and then feed those into the proper categories here on the statement of cash flows. The last major financial statement we're going to talk about is the statement of retained earnings, which is the changes in common equity accounts between balance sheet dates. So again, when you look at um, the information we just had, you had 260 million of retained earnings in December 31, 2017. You add the 2018 net income of 54 million and subtract out the 29 million in dividends. So your balance sheet retained earnings is 285. So you've got a couple spots where you're going to be able to look at where the cash went in and went out. And again, cash flow is really the critical component here for finance. And so you want to be able to look at for any company these four major statements of of financial position to be able to then get the basic information you're going to need to be able to do analysis. And now we're going to take a step into the analysis section. So now we're going to talk a little bit about financial statement analysis. And this is ratio analysis, which again allows you to translate accounting numbers into 
um, relative values to make it easier to compare period to period or company to company. So the ratios are designed to show relationships between financial statement accounts within firms, between firms, no matter what their size. So the other thing you'll hear, and you heard me call it this before, is common size financial statements. Financial position of firms with different sizes are easily compared with ratios. There's five major types. You've got liquidity ratios, which really help you analyze, can a firm pay its bills? There's asset management ratios, which is how effectively is a firm managing its assets? And again, these are difficult to evaluate in a vacuum, which is why ratios generally are also combined with benchmarks. Um, you have debt management ratios. So does a firm have the right mix of debt and equity? And can the firm handle more debt? And we're going to talk about why debt is a good thing, at least in the corporate world, um, here in a few minutes. You've got profitability ratio. So how do the combined effects of liquidity, asset, and debt management affect profit? And then market value ratios. So what do investors think about how the company is performing? Let's talk about liquidity ratios. There's two predominant liquidity ratios. You've got the current ratio and the quick ratio. So Unilate's current ratio, let's walk through the calculation of that. The current ratio is current assets divided by current liabilities. And so again, as we had mentioned, the important thing is not just what's the ratio, but also how does that ratio compare to the industry or to benchmarks? And so in Unilate's case, at the balance sheet date, so at 12-31-2018, there was $465 million of current assets 130 million of current liabilities. So that's 3.6 is the ratio. The industry average is 4.1. And so Unilate's current ratio is below the industry average, which suggests, and again, suggests is in, is in uh, italics because it's not necessarily black and white, that it's not as liquid as the average firm in the industry. So next we're going to talk about their quick ratio, which is the fastest way to be able to turn um, assets into cash. So you can see quick ratio is current assets minus inventory because that's got to go through a longer sales cycle than accounts receivable and cash. So really quick ratio is what are we likely to see in cash in the next 45 days. Um, and divided by current liabilities. So you've got the 465 in current assets minus the 270 in um, inventory gives you $195 million of, of essentially AR and cash divided by $130 million of current liabilities, which is 1.5 times. Industry average is 2.1 times. So again, the quick ratio is below industry average, which suggests it's got lower than average liquidity and if you look at you know the difference here, this is pretty close. This is getting less close, which indicates that inventory might be one of the challenges, and it calls to question whether the inventory is saleable. You know, because you've got a large amount of inventory, so is some of that inventory obsolete? Why do they have a large amount of inventory? And a lot of what you're going to find in finance is we're looking for what questions to ask management and or ask our internal folks so that we can manage the company more effectively or we can analyze the company more effectively. So the questions that I might ask are, you know, why are you carrying, why did you increase inventory by $70 million when your sales didn't go up that much? And what's the aging of that inventory? Do you have obsolete inventory that needs to get written off and disposed of? So in taking a look at those two ratios, your position might be, the uh, ratios indicate that the liquidity position is fairly poor relative to um, its industry competitors, and it suggests the firm may have some difficulty in paying bills from operations. And those ratios are also interesting. If you look at 2017 and 2018, you'll see that they're continuing to decline. And so as a result, you know, the performance of Unilate, even though it's making money, seems to actually be degrading, which also might be explaining why that market price for the stock has come down a little bit. Um, then you've got asset mass, uh, management ratios. There's four primary ratios, inventory turnover. So we're going to start diving into inventory because that's an asset. DSO, so how long is it taking them to collect their accounts receivable, fixed asset turnover, and total 
asset turnover. So inventory uh, turnover ratio, which is cost of goods sold divided by inventory. So $1.23 billion was the total cost of goods sold or COGS during the course of the year off the income statement, you have $270 million of inventory on the balance sheet. So that became 4.6x, 4.6 X, 4 .6 times. The industry average is 7.4 times. So here we're starting to see that there is an issue with inventory. The inventory turnover is below industry average. So it's taking a significant amount of time. The industry turns over the inventory every less than every two months. So 7.4 times a year, the, the the total inventory is getting turned over. Unilates taking almost three months to turn over its inventory. Um, so again, you're going okay, two months versus three months. That's an extra night, an extra 30 days. Why? Um, so it might be holding excess inventory. It certainly is holding excess in, uh, additional inventory relative to other uh, firms. And you want to understand why that is. Might be a good reason, might not be a good reason. Today's sales outstanding, um, which is receivables divided by daily sales. And so that's receivables divided by annual sales over 360. Normally, in finance, you'll see that we use a 360 day convention as opposed to 364 and a quarter days or 365 days. And it's just, again, when you're looking at ratios and some of these comparables, as long as you're using apples to apples comparisons, you're going to be okay. Um, but again, if you think about it, 12 months times 30 days per month on average gets you to 360. Um, so again, you're looking at $180 million of receivables, and then we had $1.5 billion of sales divided by 360. So we're selling about $4.167 million a day. Um, so $180 um, million in receivables divided by the daily sales is 43.2 days of of daily sales outstanding. And then the industry average is 32 days. So it's taking Unilate longer to collect its um, receivables than you're generally seeing in the industry. And that may be because they're issuing more credit or that may be because the credits that they're issuing are to companies that aren't paying on time. And so again, the goal here is to, is it's there's very few things that are black and white outside of the math. But what those what the math is doing is giving you insights into what questions to ask to help improve the cash flow position if you're the management or if you're the investor. So fixed asset turnover. So again, this is how effectively are they actually utilizing their assets um, to turn it into sales. So the only reason if you're a business that you should have an asset is because it creates sales. And so some businesses, they might have private jets and they might have uh, you know, big fancy headquarters and they might have um, company cars and all that stuff. And the only reason you should have any of that is to improve sales. And so one of the ways that that's evaluated is fixed asset turnover. How well is a company doing on its on having its fixed assets generate sales? So fixed asset turnover, sales divided by not fixed assets. So 1.5 billion in sales, we had 380 million dollars in net fixed assets that's 3.5 times the industry average is four times so this would indicate that unilate their fixed asset turnover is about the same as industry average they're probably about as efficient as normal they haven't likely over invested in a bunch of things that they don't need they seem to be doing okay and managing fixed assets total asset turnover so this is sales divided by total assets again you shouldn't have assets on the books in the event that, you know, unless you're turning them into sales. And so you've got 1.5 billion in sales divided by 845 million in total assets is 1.8 times. The industry average is 2.1 times. We know already that accounts receivable seems a little bit high and inventory seems a little bit high. Cash is low, actually has gone down year over year. And we saw that the fixed asset turnover is about on par. So you'd expect to see this be a little bit worse than industry average because the inventory and accounts receivable were a little bit high. And so that's exactly how it comes out. Unilates total asset turnovers below the industry average, which suggests it's not using all of its assets as efficiently as other firms. 
So when we look at the asset management ratios and we try and come up with some analysis conclusions, most asset turnover ratios are below industry average, which means the age of the assets is longer than other firms in the industry. And it doesn't appear to be operating as efficiently as the average firm in the industry, especially around converting inventory to cash, inventory to sales, and sales to cash. So sales from accounts receivable into cash. Debt management ratio. So this is your debt ratio, your times interest earned, and fixed charge. Those are the three basic debt management ratios. And again, this is going to analyze our ability to repay our debts. So our debt ratio, total liabilities divided by total assets. We got 430 million in total liabilities. We had 845 million in total assets, so 50.9. Industry average is 42. So the debt ratio is above industry average, which means we're probably a little bit more leveraged. Um, and we'll talk about leverage more as we go through the course, but that means we've probably borrowed more um, than other folks in the, in the industry. And so it suggests that we're using more debt to finance its assets than the average from the industry. If we look at times interest earned, that's earnings before interest and taxes divided by interest charges. And this is really a measurement of our ability to pay interest expense. And so we've got earnings before interest in taxes is 130 million. We've got 40 million in interest charges, so 3.3 times. Industry average is 6.5 times. We kind of expect this, right? Because our borrowings are higher. And so we would expect that our, our times interest earned is going to be a little bit higher than industry average. In this case, significantly higher than in, in, uh, worse than industry average. So times interest earned is well below the industry average, which suggests it's not as able to service its debt to pay the interest as the average firm in the industry. We have more debt, probably lower EBIT, and as a result, our leverage is higher, our borrowings are higher, and our ability to service our debt is lower. Fixed charge coverage. So fixed charge coverage is a pretty complex, um, pretty complex ratio. I'll walk you through each one of these elements. And again, when you're doing these calculations as you're going through your homeworks or as you're, you're working through the tests, um, don't get overwhelmed by what looks like a really complex ratio. I'll walk you through each one of these and kind of talk you through where the issues are. So you've got earnings before fixed charge coverage is essentially, here's all the things that I don't have any choice but pay. And if I don't pay them, I'm going to end up in real serious trouble because banks are going to be unforgiving creditors. Um, so I've got earnings before interest and taxes plus lease payments. So I'm adding my lease payments back because those are real borrowings. Um, they go through the operating income but we're going to treat them as debt here. So plus lease payments divided by interest plus lease payments. So again, in this particular case, we had earnings for interest in taxes, 130 million, 10 million in interest or in lease payments, 40 million in interest payments. And you can see we're adding the lease payments back in. Then plus a sinking fund payment divided by one minus the tax rate. So, Sinking funds are essentially money that gets set aside for principal, mandatory principal repayments. So you've got money that you need to pay back every every year on um, on principal, the principal amount of loans, or you need to set aside in what's called a sinking fund. Essentially, set the cash aside, put it in a restricted uh, account so that it can't be used for operations. And it's divided by one minus a tax rate because you have to do that with after-tax dollars. So it actually takes more cash to repay principal because you've got to pay taxes on the profit. And then it's only after taxes that you get to actually use that cash. So you've got a 40% tax rate, which we saw back in the, in the income statement. So we've got $8 million of mandatory prepayments or repayments of debt. And you've got to do that with after-tax dollars. So you divide it by 0.6, one minus the tax rate. And so what that is, you've got $140 million of EBIT plus lease payments divided by your mandatory payments on your debt, your interest, your leases, 
and your mandatory principal repayments, which come to 63.3 million of pre-tax dollars. So that's 2.2 times. The industry average is 5.8 times. So again, just like with the times interest earned ratio, the fixed charge coverage is well below industry average, which suggests it's not able to cover six financing charges as well as the average firm in the industry. We've got more leverage and we'll talk leverage as we go through the course. So the debt position conclusion. As a financial analyst, I'd be going, okay, the debt ratios are higher than industry average. Coverage ratios are lower. So Unilite is going to find it difficult to borrow more funds because they're already well above industry average on how much they've borrowed. And they're going to need to look at ways to improve their debt position. Then you've got the three profitability ratios, net profit margin, total return on assets, and return on common equity. Um, so profit margin is net profit divided by sales. So 54 million of net profit divided by sales of 1.5 billion is 3.6%. You can see that comes right off the um, income statement as well when we common sized it. The industry average is 4.9. So profit margin below the industry average. That suggests that we're not generating as much income per dollar of sales as the average firm in the industry. If we look at return on assets, that's net income divided by total assets. This is a measurement of how effectively you're utilizing those assets to generate income. So in this particular case, 54 million in net income, 845 million in total assets, 6.4%. Industry average is 10.3%. So Unilates ROA, return on assets, is below the industry average which suggests it's not generating the same return on its investment in assets as other firms in the industry. Again, we would expect to see that because we know inventory and accounts receivable are higher. So you can see how all these build on each other and start painting a picture of the company that's going to be a little bit more complete than just looking at finance statements going, well, they made money and they made more money this year than last year. So that must be good, right? Well, as you start looking at it in conjunction with other industry metrics, as well as year over year, you can see the Unilite is not really doing all that well. Return on common equity. So net income divided by common equity. So this is 54 million in net income divided by 415 million in net of common equity. So return on equity, 13%. Industry average is 17.7. So Unilite's ROE is below the industry average, which suggests it's not generating as much return for stockholders. So as a result, what you're seeing now is stock price might be going down because if I want to be invested in textiles and Unilate is only giving me a 13% return on equity, but another company is giving me 17.7, I'm probably going to want to be invested over there. And so you can see that may be another reason why the investments are coming down. So the operating results have suffered because of poor liquidity, poor asset management, poor debt position, that's impacting profitability. Then we've got the market value ratios, price to earnings and market to book. So PE is price to earnings ratio. A lot of times you'll see this published. When you go to Yahoo Finance or the Wall Street Journal, you'll see price per share divided by earnings per share. So we knew from the data that was given to us earlier that we were $23 price per share. You were at $2.16 earnings per share. So that's 10.6 times. The industry average is 15 times. You might go, well, that's great. I'm getting the earnings cheaper. What we're going to learn in the course is that the stock price reflects the expected future cash flow. So not what's already happened, but really what we expect to happen. And so as you've seen the performance of Unilate decline, the market has said, mm, I don't think this is performing really well, so I'm not going to pay as much for it. So when the PE ratio is below the industry average, that suggests investors consider it to be riskier. They're essentially saying, look, you got to pay me more to hold this stock because I don't think it's going to do well in the future. So if you want me to buy it, I need to get a higher return. And we're going to see how this all, this all relates as we go through the course. Market to book. So market price per share divided by book price per share. We're at $23 of market price. Book price was 16. Again, we go back to the balance sheet analysis. We had that given to us 1.4 times. Industry average is 2.5 times. Unilite's um, market to book ratio is below industry average, which suggests that on a relative basis, investors value stock lower than other firms in the industry. You can buy, you know, 
1.4 times is the amount of markup. There's only a 0.4, 40% markup on the market price per share relative to the book value of the assets. On the industry, it's 150%. So people look are looking at Unilate. The stock, stock market is looking at Unilate going, something's wrong. And so you should be able to then start analyzing what's wrong. So let's look at the what's wrong. Investors aren't excited about the future prospects of the company. That's a bottom line statement. They're not paying much for the stock. The stock price is going down. The key ratios of price earnings and market the book are showing that this is not a stock that people are excited to invest in. So let's look at a summary. And this is a DuPont analysis. And again, another complex, um, complex formula. Return on assets equals net profit margin times total assets. Um, so you've got turnover um, is net income over sales times sales divided by total assets. So again, what we've got here is net income of 54 million, sales of $1.5 million. We've got total assets of $845 million here, sales crosses. So again, what, you, what you've got is really starting to analyze with the DuPont ratio, the elements that are driving return. How much of it is attributable to poor management of assets versus lever versus poor management of financial leverage versus poor management of, uh, of profitability. And so in this particular case, uh, return on assets comes to 6.4%. You can kind of see how that breaks out here with the with these ratios. Return on equity is return on assets times the equity multiplier. And so that's net income divided by total assets times total assets times common equity or divided by common equity. So you got your 54 million divided by 845, the 845 of total assets and common equity. So these two will end up kind of canceling each other out. 6.4% times 2.036 is 13% return on equity. So you can kind of see how much of that's being driven by return on assets and how much of that is being driven by the equity multiplier. Then you've got profit margin times total asset turnover times the equity multiplier to get return on equity. You've got net income over sales times sales over total assets times total assets over common equity. So again, we're starting to break this down. You've got 54 million in net income. You got total sales of, of $1.5 billion. Total assets, 845 million. You've got common equity of 415,000 here. So you've got $3.6 million of profit margin. You've got 1.775 total asset turnover. You've got 2.036 equity multiplier, which gets you to a 13% return on equity. So again, the DuPont equation, which we just walked through, you don't see it all that often. Um, you might see it a couple times between the quizzes and the test. You tend not to see it a lot in practice. Is takes a look at the firm's profitability as measured by return on assets, the firm's expense control measured by the profit margin, the firm's asset utilization measured by total asset turnover. It takes a look at each one of those three in parallel, as you can see here, and shows you what impacts those have on return on equity. And you can compare each one of these components to the underlying relative um, comparative values for other uh, businesses in the industry and determine where you might be running into problems where you should be focusing your improvement efforts. So there's a few limitations to financial statement analysis. The first one is if you don't compare with industry averages, you're going to run into a problem. Um, because you need some benchmarks. On the other side, comparison with industry average is difficult if the firm has multiple lines of business. So if you think about Amazon, they've got book selling and they've got um, they've got the Amazon Web Services and they've got um, Amazon Prime Pantry and they've got Whole Foods and they've got so it's very difficult to go. Okay, well, who do I compare Amazon to? You almost have to break it down into the groceries into the you know, uh, cloud 
cloud computing services into the did into the, uh, the online retail and then analyze each one of those with each of those separate industries. The SEC has made this easier by requiring public companies to do what's called segment reporting and essentially break those segments out so you can see how each each segment is doing separately. Um, but that sometimes gets difficult. Um, industry average might not be the magic number that every firm could, should try and achieve. Each firm is a little bit different. So while these are guidelines, um, they don't necessarily speak black and white, which is why each one of those um, discussions we just had said suggests rather than, you know, this says that. Um, it may say that, you know, there's an issue and you can see black and white that it's lower than, but is lower than bad or good? Maybe, maybe not. It suggests some things. And again, it's the, the analysis of dying it, the diving into it is the important piece. Inflation will distort balance sheets as well. So if, you know, you bought, if Microsoft bought its campus, back in 1986 and it's showing on the books at almost zero because all the buildings have been depreciated that building or that campus is worth a lot more so the assets tied up are going to be significantly higher um, and the return on assets may look significantly better than a company that just started up in silicon valley even though the future prospects for that small company in silicon valley which has a lower return on assets might be better than amazon's or better than microsoft's because inflation has impacted the carrying value of the ratio and seasonal factors and distort ratios. So sometimes you have to build inventory in advance of like Christmas. Um, so you'll see stores and other retailers build inventory in advance of Christmas. You'll see manufacturers build inventory in advance of the orders for things like Christmas. And so depending on when your cutoff is for balance sheets, um, you might see that those ratios are impacted negatively because you see seasonality. And so there's more to analysis than just the math. The math will give you, like I said, the questions to start asking. Um, window dressing can make ratios look better than they really are. So you can see companies dump, um, dump certain assets or try and prepay certain liabilities or try and drag certain uh, uh repayments out so that the ratios look good. Um, different operating and accounting practices distort comparisons. So for instance, you may have a company that's running just in time in inventory. So they don't have much inventory, but they're far more, um, they're far more exposed to market changes in things than a company that has a bunch of raw materials inventory where they've got the inventory on their books. But if, you know, price of copper or something uh, is very volatile, they're less exposed to that than someone who might be just in time. Um, sometimes it's hard to tell whether a ratio is good or bad, which is why comparatives are important and in looking at other industry averages, but also really starting to, like I said, come up with the questions to ask management or to explore further. And then it's difficult to tell whether a company is on balance, strong or weak position just by looking at ratios. You really need to dive in, ask a bunch of questions, Make sure that you understand the business, understand things like seasonality, understand how the company's future prospects look, as well as what they're intending to do um, from a product perspective and a new markets perspective, because that may be indicating that they're in a stronger position or weaker position um, than maybe the ratios indicate. So bottom line, most important as well as most difficult agreement ingredient of successful financial statement analysis is the judgment is the analysis itself not the math not the not the comparison but really going okay how do i take all that information and how do i paint a picture um that is an accurate picture of the firm's future financial position not its current financial position but really how do i take all this information and then extrapolate out how i think the firm is going to perform in the future and again, when we talk about the value of a firm, we touched on this in chapter one, when we talk about the value of a firm, it's driven around the future value of the, of the cash flows rather than the current value of the cash flows. So make sure that you're focused on the company's future, not its current position, and trying to understand how that's telling you about the future position is gonna be most important.